and just get started. Um, I, I first want to say thank you all for being in here. Uh, it's been a real pleasure for me to come over to the Netherlands and talk about this. And it's important that I give a little disclaimer um, for this presentation because I'm going to be taking you on a, a kind of a philosophical journey. Um, my experience in lean startups and in the energy um, industry for the last 10 years. Um, I'm a, I think we should maybe set a little expectations. I'm going to talk about the U.S. Energy Organizational Statement, a little bit about uh, our social impact nonprofit. We're a 501c3. Um, we're, we're going to talk about our history, our, our seeds principle, uh, really the five principles of lean startup and what we use to kind of get to this point. Um, the energy transitions, kind of talking about demands, a little bit throughout history as well. And then we got our, our panel that I'm super excited about. And then hopefully we'll have about 15 minutes at the end for some Q&A. Uh, with that said about us, uh, it's really important that I distinguish when I say us. Um, I, I believe it's our energy. So corporate facing, it's US energy. When you're working with us, when you're partnering with us, when you're, you're in our ecosystem, it's us. It's our energy. And so that's my dad on the right. We're kind of dressed up. We like to dress up a little bit. We're from Western North Dakota. Um, I, I, go, I split my time between Boise, Idaho, and um, the Verde Valley in Sedona in Arizona. So it's safe to say I'm a fair weather chaser. Um, I, I appreciate sunshine. And um, yeah, and so we were founded in 2018. We're, we have a community events-based model. So we've had private funders, uh, sponsors, you know, and different various stake, uh, stakeholders that have supported us since then. And we, we're gonna talk a little bit about our seeds principle. Um, but here's our profile. We like to say we're sustainability coordinators, um, solutions engineers, if you will. And we like to say sustainable system design coordination is really the high level goal. And that's, it's taken a long time to get to this point. But um, finding common grounds for common good. My mentor and one of the evangelists, one of the leaders in the regenerative agriculture movement, his name is Gabe Brown. You know, he's from Bismarck and he's one of the best orators, storytellers that I've ever seen. And so I try to emulate, you know, his style a little bit, especially as a North Dakotan. Our, our motto is be legendary, that's our state motto. Um, and so our mission is be a discovery and social impact mar marketplace for sustainable solutions. So we tell stories. Um, our vision is to identify, promote, and help scale uh, solutions which benefit all. And our values, we're a, a First Nations social impact, I means my dad's a tribal member. Um, we're a Turtle Mountain Chippewa. And we, we, we call ourselves Michif, which is French Indians. You know, so North Dakota, we always go against Southern Canada. But our tribe goes to the Great Lakes, uh, into Canada, and then into, into the Dakotas. Uh, here's a little timeline. Our first seed show, and we're, we'll, we'll get into this, was in 2015 in the Bakken. And uh, the second largest oil and gas field is in North Dakota, and I'm from the seat of, of that formation, you could say. Um, 2018, we were established for 51C3, so federally exempt. Uh, the Wilson PBR was in 2019. Uh, we'll talk about that event and why it's significant. But I first visited the Netherlands in December of 2019 in, in, in hopes of planning events. And so COVID broke out, we're, we scrapped our event, we were gonna call it Carbon Global. Um, and then uh, Impact City and the Convention of Visitors Bureau was like, you should just come to Impact Fest first. And so here we are. Um, in 2020, we, we founded the Carbon Summit, the Carbon Series of events. And in 2020, 20, 2022, we have the third iteration of the Carbon Summit. I have a student social entrepreneurship program with 30 students from junior and high school, junior, senior to freshman, sophomore, juniors in college uh, with, with three different <coughs> universities. And so BEW is Boise Entrepreneur Week. That was last or two weeks ago. We gave away $350,000 to startups and, and entrepreneurs, and I'm the co-chair of the Futurism Track in that event. And so here we are at Impact Fest. So the SEEDS principle is an acronym and an analogy, and I have to be very animated with this because it's a very animated thing. And so I say the SEEDS principle is sustainability, energy, education, diversity, synergy. These things, you have to plant seeds to grow a community. 
So in students and young people's minds, you have to plant these seeds in their mind garden. And that's where we think the social entrepreneurship, it needs to be the fuel for the energy transition. And I think it's the only solution that's actually gonna work, uh, to be honest. Um, and so you pair the seeds principle with the five principles of Lean Startup, and you have to believe entrepreneurs are everywhere. The only requirement for somebody to be an entrepreneur is they want to be an entrepreneur. Because every, every skill that I have, I've had to learn. You know, and so to think of entrepreneurship as this diverse set of tools in a toolbox that you have to go develop. You have to, you have to go find them. And so ideally you can learn along the way, you have mentors and you have incentives and opportunities. And so entrepreneurship is management. We teach these people how to become business owners by having them try, prototype, build, test, experiment, and, and put, put up guardrails so if they fall down and they fail, you pick them up, you dust them off, and you say, great job, let's, let's keep going, let's keep going. And so validated experiential learning. So you're learning on the fly. You know, and we're seeing it, universities having to do this because four years, you know, for a student going to university without actually testing and prototyping these, these skills is too long for them not to be boots on the ground learning as, as they're working and building. Innovation accounting, this one is very important. So in, innovation accounting is the process of building new business models. And I'll say this, it's, it's a little controversial, but um, multinationals and governments don't innovate. Um, they need entrepreneurs and they need people to innovate for and with them. And so I worked for Baker Hughes, the, the third largest oil company in the world. And I was 25 at the time, just gung-ho to, to change the industry. I'm gonna solve flaring in my, in my home state. We have thousands of flares right now, burning gas in North Dakota like it's worthless. And here in Europe, you're kind of playing Russian roulette uh, with your natural gas. And so that's the big difference between politics and global politics and governance is that the left hand doesn't talk to the right. It's like, well, if you want to work on natural gas supply, let's go capture all of that we're burning in North Dakota. We'll start there um, and Texas and Oklahoma. You know, so there's so many things that are done really well throughout the world that doesn't get shared. You know, sharing best practices is one of our, our top goals. And so our first seed show, I had our senators uh, made videos for the event. Our lieutenant governor was uh, my keynote at the, at the event. And you know, it's, the seed's principle has changed a little bit since 2015, and we added an S, and, change some things around a little bit, but fundamentally, it's been the idea uh, from the start. And so, with that said, it has led to this. See this little graphic? This is, this is the evolution of the SEEDS principle in diversifying our partnerships and our stakeholders went from there to here. So, in 2019, uh, Professional Bull Riding Association, the PBR, um, partnered with us. Uh, I was consulting for Marquis Metalworks at the time. They're a welding and fabrication company that builds pipeline and oil field infrastructure. So I know that industry very well. Um, we raised $185,000 on this event. We put it all back into the event, sold out the show, and blew the minds of my hometown. Um, we brought in the best bulls, we brought in the best bull riders in the world, and people were just ecstatic that we're done. And so we had all this momentum and then 2020 went up in flames, you know, but the, the principles, <clears throat> they endure. And so the seeds principles in action is we talked about um, the, the stem jams. Well, uh, the, I'll give you an example of the stem jams, but this is when stem is, is not something I don't think is very familiar um, here in Europe, but in the United States, stem is an acronym for science, technology, engineering, and math. And so the students that are learning technical skills, you know, that's our engineers, you know, our, our um, yeah, I guess engineers is probably the best word, computer scientists, data engineers, you know, like those are the, the people that are needing these technical skills. And so I'm partnered with the Idaho STEM Action Center, the city of Boise and Boise State University to build out a prototype of the STEM GEMS program that my only goals are to provide incentives and opportunities for these students to problem solve. You know, so I just get the opportunity of bringing good stories and firing them up. And it's the coolest job on the planet. 
Um, we, the, the Ideas Competition, this was a, a partnership with the University of Montana and the Blackstone Launchpad. Um, we had, we sponsored a specific category called the, the Social and Climate Action category. It was their, their most submitted. Um, they had 20 some um, students, co uh, competitors, and they're actually gonna be pitching me next week on their prototypes and where to go from there. And then our third event, this is, this is a new event for us. We're partnered with uh, the state of Arizona, the Arizona Film Commissioner. Um, you may know uh, his brother is Matthew Earl Jones, Darth Vader, uh, Mufasa, and the Lion King. So his brother is the Arizona Film Commissioner. And we're putting on this event April 6th, the Southwest Film Expo. And our goal with that is to build a lean film studio that social entrepreneurs, tribes, and maybe people who don't have access to production services, we want to start building up the community in multiple ways. And I believe that film is how we tell the energy transition story. And so the genesis of this, this story comes from the Carbon Summit is that I'm a carbon being on a carbon-based planet using carbon tech. Carbon's the energy molecule. Uh, the problem that we have now is too much carbon in the atmosphere. We have to draw it back into the ground and the soil where it can be used. The, the plants in the mycorrhizal fungi, they operate on a barter system. Plants pull down atmospheric gases, mycorrhizal fungi goes out and finds soil nutrients, and they exchange. That's a sustainable system. That's the only system that's sustainable uh, on the planet. It's four billion years old. You know, so we need to take <coughs> principles that nature has already given us and reintegrate them. Extractive capitalism is failing. Um, and so 2023, I'm actually having the STEM Gem students leading a whole day of, uh, of our event um, in, in April, April 28th, 29th. And so this all ties back, if I could have found a vest that had the sun in, in all these different symbols, I would, but Paisley's would have to work. And so the sun is the energy source that sustains and connects us all. It currently sends 173,000 terawatts of energy every second um, that it is shining on the planet. That is 10,000 times more energy than we need. So we, have a, we don't have an energy deficit, we have a conversion issue. We have a utilization issue. Um, solar energy is, is our most abundant resource. It's everywhere. I mean, the sun makes up 98.9% of our gravity's, uh, or, or our galaxy's mass. You know, so it's massive, it's huge. Humanity is the sun's best tech. A lot of people don't think of humans as tech, but we are the best tech. We create tech to help us. We create tech to make things easier for us, to, um, to be autonomous. And so humans need plants and animals to convert solar energy into a chemical energy that we can consume and utilize. So we are nature. If you look at my thumbprint and you cut a tree in half, they're the same thing. You know, so um, it's really important that that piece is that we are nature. And there's often a disconnection between business and nature. Well, your nature, nature is your business. Business is nature. And so we're, we're not doing a very good job of stewarding that. Uh, the sun is a universal symbol of peace, justice, equality for all, and it rises every day. And that's why I'm so excited to be in the International City of Peace and Justice, because that is a very bold statement, and I've come to see how we can be of service. And so I'll take it even farther. And this is also a little controversial, because I believe all energy derives from the sun, um, and the red energy being my muscles, my energy. Um, that's how, you know, it's taken us so far to build these civilizations. And I believe that this is the most important one that never gets talked about, is human, human's energy. Um, black energy is what we call fossils. Green energy, biomass, RNG, renewable natural gas. Um, invisible would be wind, uh, gravity. Theoretically, we can, we can harness gravity, but we haven't yet, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, but there is something that physically holds us um, in, in exact proximity to the sun. Pure water, blue, oceans, orange, geothermal, reflection, mirrors, solar, PV, heat concentrated, and the most abundant el element in, the, in our universe is hydrogen. And so with that said, we can see how this progression is going to go. You know, we've, uh, humanity has already, you know, kind of leveraged uh, human energy. Uh, we're, we're currently on fossils trying to transition into uh, renewable uh, types of energies, and I believe that the end is, is going to come with figuring out better ways to optimize the sun's, the, the sun's capacity. 
And I think you know once once that gets done, we'll we'll reach a, a, another level of, of humanity. And the reason I say that is because energy demands have been the causes and the consequences of, of wars and conflicts, slavery and servitude, genocide and coup d'etats. It's all related to energy. You know, so whether it's the pharaohs in, in Egypt, they needed more people to build their, their civilizations. And we are still seeing that with Ukraine and Russia. Um, it's an energy battle, you know, and so it's a resource battle. Whatever you want to call it, resources, land, food, it's all energy. Um, and so peace, you know, by solving this, we will achieve peace if we can come up with universal energy systems. Well, there's one that's already uh, quite available. Uh, the reason that is, because this is, here's 2000, I mean, uh, this is 1990, here's 2020. So 30 years in the age of technology, you would think we would have made leaps and bounds in the, the, the types of energy that we're using. So we've actually, we've added, we lost a little oil, we've added more coal, we've added more natural gas, 2% in renewables in 30 years. That's the capacity that we have. So if we plan to reach 2035 and 2050 goals, the, the proposals on the table right now will not work. They're just not going to work. Because the people that created the problem are being expected to solve the problem, but culturally, it's a cultural problem. You know, so we have to think outside the box, and that's why I say social entrepreneurship is the way to do that, because I can plant a million seeds you know, across the world without individually talking to all these people, getting them excited. When they're ready, they come and they say, hey, like, look at our solution, or look at this, look at that. And then those are multipliers. Those things work together. And to take it even farther, if you look at 100 years of global emissions, the only time they've ever um, gone down is, is from conflict, crisis. We need to stop being a crisis society. Humanity has never come together for common good. It's only come together to fight common bad. And this, the, data, the proof is in the data. You know, so if we're going to make this transition happen, what we're doing right now is not working. And there's things that work really well, but the scale factor is not there because I've heard a lot of people say, we need the big guys to come in and lead this transition. Well, they're not gonna do it, otherwise they already would. They already would be. You know, so I'm not waiting for their permission to talk about these things and do something about it. I have a brother who's 17. You know, I, I work with students all the time. They get it. When I pitch up, that's when people, well, you should, you should worry about this. Oh, you need to think about that. Well, you should probably not do this. When I pitch students and college kids, they're like, how do we get started? Where do we go? What do we need? You know, so you can help me. I want to help you. We need that cultural difference. And so in the United States, our politics are messed up. You know, our politicians, they ain't talking to me, they ain't asking me for solutions. You know, they're making policy, you know, based on bureaucracy, they're making off of money. And so that's the problem. And so how do we do this? You know, how does a lean startup person, I, I grew up in a trailer in, you know, the outside of, of, you know, my little town in North Dakota. And people, Arizona was on the other side of the country. But now I am, am actually on uh, the other side of the world, you know, where th this is a dream is why I'm here. And so we have partnerships from events. Uh, Impact City, we're planning to partner with them with our Carbon Summit. University, I work with Boise State University, Northern Arizona University, Arizona State University. Uh, businesses, we have several sponsors and stakeholders that I can go to, whether it's solar, geothermal, um, education, academia, like to where they're all experts in their fields, and I don't claim to be an expert in, in really anything, uh, but I'm a pretty good promoter. And so that's where I see my value is helping tell stories. Um, and then cities, I, you know, I'm working on trying to connect the city of Boise, which is uh, the city of trees in Idaho, the capital of Idaho, the fifth fastest growing city in the United States with The Hague, an international city, sister city partnership. There's a lot of things that The Hague does well, and there's a lot of things that, you know, Boise does well. Um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful city. And so that's, you know, partnerships allow us to increase our expertise, our knowledge base, add resources, mitigate risks, amplify our branding, reach a bigger audience. And so that's what we have to do. You know, people say go quickly. 
We, I hear a lot of governments and, and champions saying, go quickly, go quickly. But it's, it's kind of like telling a rat on a wheel to go faster. You know, if you don't have a vision and you don't have order in this, in this system, it's like, we need to go faster, we're running, running, running. Well, where are we going? You know, and so this is, this is where we're at, is, is where are we going? And so with that, um, I, have a little, I have a little experiment to play. And this is, everybody's gonna take it, everybody's gonna take it. And so I was supposed to give these out right away. I was supposed to give these out right away. And I was gonna tell you not to open them. <laughs> but those are those are all yours. Now, we'll see. This that's the start. This is the seed of that million. And so the reason I want to I want to give you guys these um, is is for the fact that you probably haven't seen a two dollar bill, and it's our most beautifully designed bill um, in the United States, and it actually has our Declaration of Independence on it. So this guarantees my right to dream. Um, it's actually in our constitution to dream and be able to petition my government to challenge their stances on things. And so as an American, it's my responsibility to petition my government to do the right thing. And this, is, this shows it why I'm here. And so what I want you guys to do is some people aren't particularly excited that it's all white guys you know, on there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I say, hey, if you had the perfect uh, dream or the perfect picture, what would you paint that? You know, and then think of it when you look at that bill, look at it, it's like put your dream into there. And then see, and ideally it's a souvenir, you know, it's an energetic exchange, it's a gift, you know, that in my culture on my Native American side is that when we meet people and you meet new tribes, you bring gifts, you bring offerings of saying, hey, I want to, I want to get to know you, you know, I want to help, I want to be of service. And so with, with that said, um, I, I tried to rush through that because I don't necessarily want to be... Um, the key focal point here, I think I, I want to under, try to understand um, the, the Dutch and, and the Netherlands and how we can be of service because there's things that you do very, very well. Um, and one of the things to think about is you can't grow anymore. There's, you can't expand your borders. You know, so now you're focused on efficiency and optimization. Where in the United States, we're urban sprawling kind of out of control in many places. You know, so our growth is, is there's no order to it. You know, and that's what the city of Boise is like, hey, we've got all these people coming from California, Texas, all over. And so we need help in, in mobility, mixed use, high density, urban development. There's places like the Netherlands that have figured it out. You know, and so there's things that we can share. And then so with, with that said, uh, if we want to come up and, you know, just, just I maybe just plop around here, guys. Yeah. Come on up and... Oh, wow. Well, see, I downloaded the. Okay. So we had a, a last minute substitution with unknown, but yeah, it was yeah, right. Yeah, let's bring them up. Do you guys want these or these? Maybe those with facts? Yeah, I'm yeah, real, real informal here. Yes. And so, yeah, it's uh, very interesting putting together a panel across the seas with events you've never been at and with people you're trying to make relationships with and then having them trust you. Be like, and when I showed them, you know, it's like, oh, you better give some disclaimers here. I'm like, well, I'm kind of a rock star in terms of concerts and things like that, so I like to leave an impression. And I, I feel that relationships are the key to this. And so I want, you know, people to like and trust that we're going to do what we're saying we're going to do. You know, with that said, uh, maybe Martin, you want to lead us off, just give an introduction, kind of who you're with, um, maybe just a short tagline of, of EVPA. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Martin Boom. Uh, I'm with EVPA. EVPA is a network for investors for impact, as we call it, uh, in in Brussels, European over 300 members, foundations, corporates, and impact funds. Um, personally, that last group is my group. Um, I run the Impact Funds Initiative and I help some of our partners that are in the process of setting up uh, impact funds. Um, and before going to the person next to me, um, 
I used to have a company, I still have a company actually, which, which was called Dream Business, so I was kind of <laughs> struck <laughs> by, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 write a dream, uh, uh, we tried to bring that to business for a while as well. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> well, we got two, two guys come in here, let me, let me share this. Yeah. It talks about the dreams, and I'll have to fill you guys in after, but I just want to make sure everybody has them. Yeah, I'm, I'm Raymond. I work as an investment manager for Enwani. Uh, Enwani is a European investor in, uh, or like to call it, a value add investor uh, for renewable energy startups. Uh, we're located all across Europe and we're partially funded by the European Union and by shareholders, which is a mix of industrial partners, uh, research companies, and uh, universities across, uh, across Europe. And um, the whole package of funding we put in one box and we spend it on. Uh, Investments on uh, renewable energy startups. Uh, we also have uh, set up about seven masters together with European universities in the field of renewable energy, uh, which is a two year master, uh, one year more on the technical side, and then the entrepreneurial side, which is more than our long term view to educate the entrepreneurs of, of tomorrow, which also you know, I jumps a bit with your, uh, your ideas. And uh, if, if those people don't start uh, their own company, we try to incorporate them in our ecosystem uh, across Europe, you know, to become an employee within our startups, within our ecosystem in, uh, in Europe. And uh, we have a portfolio of about 200 little Bengi companies in Europe and about 700 million euros so far since 2010 approximately, which makes us one of the biggest in the world uh, when it comes to little Bengi entrepreneurial startups. First, uh, thanks to Jason for uh, giving us a, a whirlwind of a story around energy, <laughs> connecting uh, philosophy, religion, history, and war and entertainment. Uh, but there's enough uh, seats in there for us to uh, pick Think up. About it, yeah. so, thank you for that. Um, my name is Peter Schijfel. I'm based here in The, Hel uh, in the Hague. I was going to say Den Helder, that's where I was born. Uh, that's a Navy town, and that is uh, also the journey for me to start uh, working in uh, marine energy and uh, meets uh, all sources of uh, energy that you can harvest at sea. Uh, temperature difference, uh, salinity difference, uh, tidal energy, wave energy, floating solar, uh, and more and more looking at integrating those solutions uh, in the wind farms that are coming up. As you rightly said, the Netherlands is a very small country, so our energy transition is also taking place at sea. And uh, I believe uh, the next 30 years, the biggest changes are going to happen there. And there's a lot of pressures uh, coming together and what I do is I create projects and I go to uh, really uh, kind of funding to apply there and uh, put a consortium together with a focus on getting demonstration projects in the water now that hopefully will contribute in 2013 to, the, to our uh, targets for uh, offshore renewables. All right, well, uh, fortunately I'm not wrong. <laughs> Uh, my name is Opal, uh, I'm a startup lead at Oplo. And uh, what that means is that I'm the one who looks for startups uh, for us to invest in, but also uh, for startups that we can support by connecting them with corporates to really scale their solution. Uh, I think as Justin also rightly said, this, uh, corporates are notoriously and bad at change. <laughs> and uh, innovation and open innovation is one way that they can accelerate. And uh, what I do in my everyday and kind of work is that I meet uh, great founders with amazing ideas, powering that energy transition. Well, thank you guys for that. And you know, I'm, I'm, I have to say, I'm very excited uh, about this this panel, just from the diversity of organizations, you know, thoughts. Other than you know, I try to get some women on, on here to be to be quite honest, and they were all booked before that we could, we could get them. Um, you know, but I, I think that diversity also comes with ideas, thoughts, different places. Like, you, you guys may never meet somebody from North Dakota. I mean, there's lots of people in the United States that don't meet North Dakotans. Um, but it's the frozen tundra, it's the northern Great Plains. Um, and so it's just a, it's an honor to be able to come here and talk, talk like this. And so there's very different needs, like in Idaho, Arizona, North Dakota, even there, there's a big difference in diversity from the, the Northern Plains, where it's frozen half the year, to the, the um, Sonoran Desert in, in Southern Arizona, uh, with, with Phoenix and, and all that. And so, just thinking of, of what your civilization or your society has done, you know, it's, it's interesting to think that the Netherlands can't really grow um, 
you can't expand your borders, but you're focused on efficiency and optimization now. Um, and, and that's a really interesting place to be in because, you know, as I said, we're still sprawling in the U.S. and in parts of places, so we need to share those best practices. And so that would be, maybe we go down the line here and say, where do you, how, how would you define the energy transition? And what would you say is probably a, uh, a big opportunity you know, in, in taking action? If, you, if you'll allow me, I'll translate to my expertise, which are the funds, and I'd like to, I'd like to refer to, to, to a WhatsApp message that I actually got yesterday uh, of, of, uh, of a befriended investor um, in, this, in, this, in, this, in this community of investors, small community. And he said, like, is it just me, or are the energy funds like uh, popping out of everywhere right now? Um, probably has to do with COP currently going on in Egypt. Uh, um, but there's there's definitely there's definitely a lot of interest and a lot of funding going up about energy now. The um, question is, is it this rat in the in the wheel that you were talking about? Is it uh, uh, labeling funding in a different way and not really, uh, really uh, creating any result because climate is a popular topic, or is it really gonna, really gonna make a change? But I definitely have some examples of good funds that have started popping up, uh, um, early stage, often starting teams. So all the problems you can have to to start fundraising on the on the climate sector. And I think one of the, yeah, I personally like the, uh, an initiative from. From Luxembourg that started a couple of years ago, uh, also a member of TFPA, um, that has actually set up an accelerator for these early stage funds. So it's an accelerator not for the company, but an accelerator of starting funds. And I think these new funds, these starting funds, deserve deserve more support and more more funding uh, uh, because they can actually um, react more like the students you work with, like uh, not go faster in the same wheel, uh, but go faster on a different track and see that the change can happen. I think my neighbor has some experience in that, actually funding those initiatives that have maybe difficulty funding as well, and yeah. a bit more um, risk taking on, uh, on that as well. Yeah, yeah that's correct. I mean, uh, it already was founded by the European Union actually to, to accelerate the energy transition. I mean, it's, it's in our core, in the core of the company, and uh, especially focusing on innovative startups that have a positive impact on the energy transition. And uh, we can already start at a, at a very early stage, TRL 3 to 5, where normal VCs would say, well, you know, first uh, uh, take out the energy, uh, the technology risk, and when you have your first customer, then we might be interested, and they all hope that you come up with a software proposition because, you know, deep tech, high tech is all very scary, and will it work, etc. So um, for us, energy transition is, is like, you know, ensure the energy uh, safety and security, and, and also the cost of the, of the energy and the, over the supply chain, which basically means make renewable energy affordable and accessible to everybody in the first of all in Europe but also the rest of the world. Uh, decrease CO2 emissions and also when it comes to renewable energy also improve the uh, competitiveness of, uh, of Europe. Uh, so what we like to do is have the value chain approach. Uh, first of all when companies come into a portfolio we try to connect them with an ecosystem to de-risk uh, their proposition whether it's supply chain related, whether it's uh, sales related, pilot project related, and uh, yeah, I think that that's what it comes down to when, when, when we speak about the real money. I'm really excited about Edo Energy, and actually to talk, have further conversations just because you are a leading investor in this energy transition, and uh, lots of companies have you know networks and portfolios of, of the kind of startups and entrepreneurs are working for. And my favorite thing to do is work with that entrepreneur, whether they're three, five years in, and just get them really excited, get them fired up. Yeah, you mentioned know, earlier partnerships. I mean, that's also the whole idea when it comes to the NOND, the, the knowledge triangle, as we like to call it, the combination between research, innovation, universities, and, uh, and industry. And by connecting those three together, research, uh, universities, and industry, to, to you know, accelerate that industry. That's why we also set up a master, a master classes, so um, a master education with uh, some of the university, universities. Lots to talk about. Well, um, the energy transition for me, um, well, I want to actually lend maybe a quote that I heard during the food uh, session before. I said, if you want to know what to do now, you need to first know where you want to be in the future. 
there's clear targets for 2050 to become uh, fully uh, carbon free in our energy system. That means both on electricity generation and also on our fuel consumption. So we want to have a hydro, uh, hydrogen economy. And I think if you really want to be there, uh, you need to have surpluses of renewable energy. Renewable energy must be so cheap that you can make lots and lots of hydrogen. And then with the hydrogen, you can fuel all your needs. So we have to think about how can we create as much as possible renewable energy at the lowest cost possible. Um, it has to be very democratic, uh, so it has to be possible everywhere. Uh, it has to be possible in the desert, it has to be possible in the sea, and it has to be possible in your back garden. Um, but you need lots and lots of it, and so you need to invest in uh, the new options. And then I come to my territory, uh, the one that are supplementary to uh, when there is no solar and when there is no wind, there is always water. And water can be very complementary to wind and solar, because it's available and more predictable. So, uh, for example, wave energy uh, continues after the days that it's been windy. So you have a sort of lagging effect. Tidal energy is as predictable as the position as the moon. For the next 100 years, you know exactly when you're going to have the peaks. Um, temperature differences are constant 24-7 uh, between top surface and deep water. Uh, and salinity gradient uh, is everywhere where you have rivers flowing out into the sea. And all of these sources are completely unused. And if we would have solutions for that, we would not have an energy crisis. So I really believe that in addition to uh, wind and solar, we first have to invest uh, in renewable energy generation before we think about energy storage. We're talking now about investing so much in storage, and we've not yet depleted all the options for renewable generation. Yes, a lot. I mean, like, that's yeah. more important than, let's say, the storage. And just to add to your point, I think the tropical oceans and the, and the, the seas in two weeks uh, absorbs as much uh, solar kinetic energy as one trillion barrels of oil and gas equivalent. Um, and so that's all that we use in a year is absorbed every two weeks by the, the warm tropical oceans. You know, so the, the ocean is already a huge conductor for us, but we just haven't really utilized it. And honestly, obviously our, our country on the ocean, it's a much bigger impact where all the states that I live in doesn't have the ocean. You know, so water is, you know, the rivers are our main generation source, and we use dams, uh, and those have been controversial uh, for our salmon in Idaho. Uh, we know that the salmon are going to go extinct in, in about seven years, and so that's the, the balancing act. It has to be nature inclusive. Yeah, yeah. Everything that we are working on now is, especially in new territories, sea space has to be new nature inclusive. So but before that, we need to test, 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 test. Yeah. And then you can ask Piotr, because you're an investor in one of those solutions. Why do you need to Sorry? Piotr Chilwell. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, a, of course, an exciting new opportunity. Piotr gaps between all the wind farms of Europe with Piotr Chilwell balance off, and the wind's not blowing there as often in the sunshine. So you have a much higher total uh, energy production. And the grid's already kind of there, the infrastructure's there, right, to a certain extent? Well, it goes, the, the trouble is not too much to but it's so, it's so much energy the peaks, so the, the, the high peak is too high for the grid that's already there. Gotcha. So that you need to upgrade it, but in principle, yes, there is sort of some energy, mm -hmm. and you can calculate it like you need only like 5% of the Dutch coastal uh, seawater covered with solar, only 5%. To, to generate enough electricity for the Netherlands. Thank you. If I may add to that, I mean, our latest investment was in a tidal wave guide uh, developed by a Dutch company. And you've got to be fully aware that you know, the renewable energy mix cannot only be solar and the wind, it has to be, you know, yes, we have to add other technology as well. So that's why you're investing in the type of company. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, so the energy transition uh, for me is more of a Systematic shift away from huge centralized parts, such like all the refineries, all the fields, uh, the big um, tankers, and all the storage tanks, and all that, uh, to more decentralized systems where everyone has a little bit more closeness to uh, be able to create their own energy. For example, solar panels or uh, energy storage um, at your home. 
until we can get to a place where we can use hydrogen, because uh, we don't really have an efficient way to store energy over a long period of time and transport it, uh, let's say, over the oceans from somewhere where solar is, uh, it's very easily accessible. Uh, so that would be uh, it for me. And, uh, in terms of opportunities, obviously, and I spend uh, all my days working with entrepreneurs, so I think my, my answer could be more clearly uh, clear say that uh, I believe entrepreneurs will be the ones to fix, to fix the energy transition. And there's many great ones here today, so I, I hope you also have a chance to, to meet some of them. Well, yeah, thank you guys for sharing that. It's really important that we understand the context because energy transition means different things to different people, different things to different countries, different things to different governments. And so uh, the goal of kind of this panel is to find common ground, you know, kind of that common good. And uh, we, we, we talk about lead startups, we talk about partnerships, and events, I think, is where collective actions can happen. Because I, I wouldn't have been able to meet you guys in any other situation. You know, other than an event like this. And that's where I've always found, um, I started doing events in 2013. Um, not anything good for the first couple of years. I was losing money and frustrated as heck. But um, every time I did an event, something good would come out of it. I'd meet people, they'd, you know, they'd cheer me on, or they'd be like, hey, we, we do this, maybe we can help you next year. Or you just don't know what's gonna happen when you, you know, show up to things like this. And I think Impact Fest, I was blown away by this, this event's infrastructure, this venue, the food, the drinks. You know, like this is a big undertaking here um, that, you know, sometimes it happens at big conferences in the United States, but this feels a little different. I think this feels um, really positive. Like I'm really encouraged, you know, by being here and just seeing, I, I think I've heard Impact um, quite a bit from every, out of everybody's mouth, which is not the case know sometimes in the United States you know so that's where we need to come and tell you know the impact stories that are already being done, done here and then I need to bring them back to the United States and say hey look what they're doing like we can do this too you know, so I have to bring back best practices to share with politicians our big corporates you know because you know as, as we see maybe in the world wars once the United States gets involved and takes it seriously and says hey we're going to do this they, we have a very loud voice. Um, whether or not it's been used for good uh, recently, that's definitely debatable. Um, maybe not that good. And so we'd like to change that. And that's the, the common grounds for common good. And so what would you guys say uh, maybe the biggest challenges that you see you know, for this transition in you know, kind of catalyzing it or helping it go into a full scale type of approach? Even from a networking standpoint, of what, do you, what is your network how would they feel about, you know, maybe entrepreneurship or sustainability, climate action? Uh, with the risk of sounding a bit like a broken record here, um, uh, the opportunity is always the other side of the challenge, right? So the, the uh, I think for this energy, this energy transition to 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 succeed, we need we need to support different things new things, things that go beyond imagination a bit, whether it's solar at sea, I think like a lot of people in, uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands don't have a, have, a, have a clear view or a clear picture in their mind what it, what it is about. So we, I think the biggest challenge is that we start investing in same, same old, same old uh, with, with different kind of funding, and that's from a funding perspective. Uh, I don't know if you agree, but I, I, would, I would support Investing in those funds and investing in those companies and really do something new and really get that scale up in, in, in big time. Do things different and not do things in the pace that the existing industry wants us to go in because it's probably too slow to make. Yeah, I think one of the hurdles is probably also willingness amongst the companies. I mean, really feeling the need and urgency to, to change. Um, I think the last couple of years with the whole pandemic, etc., showed that if you really need to change and you want to do stuff, then it's absolutely possible to do stuff. The same with the Ukraine crisis right now, you know, if you have to transfer to a renewable energy because you, know, you don't have any gas or you don't have no access to gas, then I think things uh, can be done. And also, law and regulation, I think it all can also be a very important barrier. You know, in a lot of cases, the law is you know, running behind the technology. In my opinion, that's also one of the, the, the hurdles. 
I'm going to use the metaphor of a Dutch bike. Since you're so interested in Dutch culture as well, <laughs> I've seen you cycle. Yeah. yeah. So in order to ride a bike well, uh, you have to be in balance and uh, press on both sides at the same time. It's very simple. That's how we all start. And I think uh, what we need to make sure is that technology developers, on the one side, are well aligned with government policymakers. And this is this concept also that you're saying of validated learning. Technology developers need to know that each time they are de delivering on their, on their technology and that they're validating what they're doing actually adds value to the purpose that the government is working for. So that they're working, for, so that he knows, okay, they are validating one step in their technology development, now I can take the next step. Uh, and so we need to also understand each other's language because technology developers are working with technology readiness level, investors are working with commercial readiness index, uh, these are things that we understand as our toolbox, but on the government side, we're thinking about jobs, CO2 emission, and security, safety, and, and, and they're not really thinking about all the policy steps that are needed for all these incremental steps from these innovators. It's like, okay, we have the big funds and what? So we, we need to have a toolbox, which I would like to say is sort of adaptive policies that actually follow each step as we are going through the TRLs and that you know, as technology developers, we have to deliver, and then they can step up. Yeah, I agree. You know, just thinking about bikes being a simple analogy, that they're arguably the most efficient machine that we have on the planet. You know, and so if you think of billionaires, and you put that in a bike's equivalent, let's say we have a billionaire that has a billion dollars, uh, a really good bike's a thousand bucks. So this guy is, is, has a million bikes sitting in his bank account, where he's, he's Dutch, and he has all these kids and students that want to ride bike. He's like, well, no, I mean, you gotta give me a proposal. You gotta give me a pitch to use my bikes. And so we need to change that culture to where we're, we're giving out bikes and letting people ride these and figure out how to use them and use that energetic exchange to build the, that toolbox. You know, because we have a lot of people hoarding bikes right now, you know, and, there's, and it's pretty easy to find out who they are. You know, so we need to have the bike revolution happen and allow people to ride bikes. And so that's, kind of a, an analogy for that. Um, and because I think riding bike is the most, one of the most productive things and fun things that, 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 I, that I do. You know, and Boise actually has a green belt that the, the Boise River runs right through the, our downtown, and it's the most beloved piece of infrastructure in the city, is that bike green belt. So on the, on the topic of, uh, of analogies, uh, I heard this from, a, from an entrepreneur yesterday, actually, and I thought it was incredibly interesting. So, in the way that you finance and buy a house, you give your house as a security so the bank can get back their money. It works the same for oil and gas companies. It's just that their money is, is the oil in the ground. So they are fully, fully dependent on having to extract this oil in order to finance themselves, because it's 100% their underlying assets. And I think for me at least, this is a huge risk in order to accelerate the energy transition, because oil and gas companies, I know they're often seen as evil, but they don't really have a choice, because that's where their financing comes from. Their mortgage. Exactly. So to me, that is a huge, uh, huge barrier to accelerating the transition. And to your point, their only option is downscale. You know, because they can't sustain their production. Yeah, but you can't do that either if you're a public company. But they, they, they will have to. And I may add on to that. Uh, of course, here in the Netherlands, we have one of the highest concentrations of offshore oil and gas uh, capabilities uh, anywhere in the world. If you put your finger on the, on the map, we have here all the biggest companies together. <coughs> and those biggest companies, uh, if you ask them individually, Herma, uh, Huisman, uh, Blue Water, all of them, they're starting to, uh, from the word, they're starting to get on the tipping point where more than half of their income is already being generated from offshore wind developments. So it's only the other half that is oil and gas, and that is that is already diminishing. Of course, it will be there for some time. They are actively pursuing and looking to invest in renewables. We just have to help them show and de-risk the technologies that they can install and build. And, and just to add your point, that was very interesting. A point about oil and gas, like in the Bakken, in our in the second largest oil formation in North America, they they have five to seven years left of the production capacity that they're at now, and the the formation is already sputtering. 
you know, so the uh, Department of Mineral Resources has already said, hey, like, we peaked, you know, we're at peak oil right now. And so that leaves a five to seven year window, you know, to transition before our supplies start going like this. It's not gonna go like this, it's gonna go down. You know, because you have, these are pressurized wells, so you have to drill, you have to drill, and you, and you dr drill horizontals. You know, so you're going like this, and then you're going down for miles. And so once those are depleted, you've depleted the whole field. You know, and so that's one thing that, you know, people, I think, Middle East doesn't talk about is, they talk about demands, but they don't talk about their supply. You know, because if you said, well, we only got 10 years left, well, we need to transition right now. You know, so they're not telling you what their supply is at. They're trying to extract the most value out of those stranded assets. If they're stranded, they're stranded if they can't sell, you know. And so um, they don't want to talk about stranded assets. And so maybe uh, if I can put another asset uh, against it, uh, the targets for for the North Sea for offshore wind development is uh, 150 gigawatts of offshore wind uh, between now and 2050. Uh, and over the next eight years, we're going to have to do. 10 times more than what we've done in the last 10 years. So is it, there's a huge uh, growth market for oil and gas sector to be involved in realizing those ambitions. So the, the attractive side should be on that market pool. Yeah. Yeah, so the wind is the next asset. You know, and Ecuador is a great example of that. You know, like they're backed by the Norwegian government, kind of, I'd say, and so they have this tremendous <coughs> resource pool. So allow having their culture change because they used to be stout oil when I was growing up. And they were a big presence in North Dakota. Um, and then once Anders Okal took became CEO, I was so excited. It's like, hey, we're Ecuador now, we're transitioning. I sent him a message, he sends me one back, connects me with his uh, one of his VPs of development. And they basically say, hey Jason, sorry, we're selling all our North Dakota assets. Um, they're too you know essentially they're too dirty. Uh, without saying that, but saying that. And say we're out. I'm sorry. That's like, oh, okay. Is this the strategy of the, you know, the, the multinationals is just to sell their dirty assets and say they're clean on the side? You know, it's like history doesn't forget that. You know, and so um, I want. And usually when they sell those dirty assets, it's to a lower standard company that are willing to take those assets on and extract the rest of those resources. So it's a double-edged sword. You know, that's a that's a slippery slope there. And I'd say so. In, in, in catalyzing the energy transition, I've found that students and entrepreneurs, they need two things. They want those opportunities and they want incentives. And obviously the, 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 the main one is, is capital investment, you know, but how is, how is maybe your organization, EVPA, how are they offering incentives to maybe build your network? Hmm. Incentives as well, incentives could be, you know, a variety of different things. Like we do scholarships, or we put on, you know, pizza parties. We throw concerts. You know, we do events. You know, um, there's lots of different ways that pe people are incentivized. Obviously, the the biggest one being money, okay. and maybe maybe how you use that, you know, for an investment. Is 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 working working together and providing the knowledge and the experience that one has to to the other. Uh, providing this possibility, possibility to share either in events, but also in our reports, in our research, uh, also in our trainings, uh, um, um, but also just just by connecting, which, which, which always sounds a bit vague in most of the time. I'm looking to events as well, and people are just, just talking, but I was just at a session right there where a couple of our members got together, not on the topic of energy, uh, but it could be the topic of energy, by the way, but it is on the topic of health. And they really said, like, we want to kind of group together with three big organizations. It was Bayer Foundation, it was um, uh, uh, Social Value Anel, it was uh, uh, Beringer Ingelheim on health. And how can we provide health care to those that need it the most? And how can we fund those organizations that are developing it in one go instead of all going our own big run uh, steps? So I think there's a lot to be done there. There's a lot to be done on the impact on kind of Connecting, connecting the impact measurement and all the, so how do we really prove that what we do is we do well uh, um, and how can we make that talk to each other. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's the incentives, uh, I don't know if that's our, that are incentives, but it is the incentives that we have for our members to join and to cooperate and to, to group. 
Well, I, I like to, when I come to an event, I talk to people, you know, that whoever is willing to talk, and I ask them about companies. So it's like, well, this is our panel. Do you know any of these guys? And then uh, what the feedback I get from the EDPA is it's a good network. You know, and so that kind of sums it up right there. It's like, you're a good network. You know, that's, that's important. You know, yeah, so. and to, but it, it, I always, what I enjoy most about the network is those people, like a person like Eleni from WeShare, if you, if you get the chance to talk to her, she's just, she's, just, she's just using the network in the best possible way. She's just grouping these people together and saying, let's start doing something together yeah, instead of just cool. talking. And that's uh, uh, where the network uh, has real, real value, value, real impact, real money, real uh, things. Yeah. So maybe that could be a good opportunity as well to connect with their network and see if we can get such a community of practice around uh, energy. Yeah, I look at incentives, if, if I go through the, the, the different uh, stakeholders we have in our ecosystem, for example, the, our Shell, I mean, they, they put in a significant amount of money to be part of the, the ecosystem in the Shell, and they don't have an immediate return in, 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 in uh, an investment incentive of money, but they're at the front row seat of all the latest uh, innovation when it comes to renewable energy, so that's why they become a part of, uh, of Innovation in the Shell. If I look at students, uh, they have the opportunity to to start their own renewable energy company and to be part of, uh, of our ecosystem as an employee. And uh, we also have uh, our annual event called Business Boost, where we bring together all our startups, about 150 to 200, uh, where they can pitch, present themselves, uh, where we bring in our VC community, our ecosystem to connect. And again, there's maybe not an immediate return of investment when it comes to you know, make a deal, but connections are made. And indeed, that's maybe a bit vague, but in the end, it always leads to something. So I think that's also an important incentive for our startups. Uh, apart from the fact they have the opportunity to, to to live their dream in that sense. But everybody started with a dream to have some kind of technology turn into a product and to sell it and make this place into a better, better world. You know, Inno Energy, I think you're in a really unique position um, to help catalyze these things. You have a university. You know, you're, you're working with the EU. Um, you're connected with all these companies. Uh, it's just you know a matter of for me it's like okay how do we how do I add this social entrepreneur fuel to your infrastructure or your vehicles and kind of blast off is, is, is what I'm working on in my mind when I look at your organization. Yeah. Um, yeah. For me, I'm sorry. There's a question. Yeah, I just, I, it's a little bit to ask the question. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you. Um, I, I suppose it's important for us to remember that it is, we're in the middle of an energy transition. And you spoke earlier in your presentation about this, sometimes this disconnect between business and nature. And you made reference as well that in the choices that you're making, you're talking about nature and inclusivity. And what I'm curious about is whether there are criteria for funders uh, that would actually say go or no go from a nature perspective on a particular project because we don't want to make the mistakes of the past about the consequences of particular choices that we make. So I'm, for example, very curious about the long-term impact of batteries and what happens 20, 30, or 40 years down the line with these old batteries. And, um, you know, it's just really to see is there a criteria uh, within the funding for example, to say no, go or no go on a project, rather than the short-term impact of all the new renewables for now. So that was my question about the horizontal aspect of solar versus the impact on the marine life and moving back to this kind of European protection of the marine. So it's just a question. So for a fund. Well, about what I suppose it's what nature inclusivity means and mm -hmm. how that impacts the well, if I look at, for example, the, the company that we really invested in, which is the Tidal Wave Company, mm -hmm. they have to deal with all kinds of programs, including you know, what's the impact on, on sea life, and what's the impact of the kite when they move through the, the waves. And so from that point of view, we, we look at it, and I'll, I mean, speaking about batteries, I mean, there will be a law in play, but it means that battery factory in Europe also need to dismantle the battery when they come back and cannot just simply ship them off to China or Africa again. So, uh, we see also an increase in, in proposals of uh, startup that working on the, uh, the reuse of batteries, but also you know uh, remining, if you like to call it like that way, of batteries. Take out the lithium again, and and even with AI and robots, and uh, so so it's, 
it's certainly a, an issue that we're looking at. Yeah. Maybe I can add to that. Uh, within my domain, then at least uh, government, of course, can set up tenders where there is uh, conditions set for nature inclusivity. And that is being done now for the offshore wind farms, mm -hmm. where they have to address this. And I actually believe that this can be a big enabler for nature restoration. If we're going to develop 150 gigawatts of offshore wind mm -hmm. and other sources of renewable energy, and if government is going to be sort of setting out uh, industrial areas at sea, because that's basically what it is, instead of them land, I'm going to give you a, a piece of sea, then they can set out those conditions. And it can be a driver for na nature restoration, because you can you know, build artificial uh, uh, reefs as part of your uh, infrastructure. Yeah. But those things have to be demonstrated first. And then part of demonstration is certification. Yeah. So, and that is why we need to test, 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 and develop certification schemes to prove which measures are effective, and to demonstrate that a measure can actually be scaled up in a wind farm and be, uh, be positive. Yeah, because it's, it's the incomparison to what is kind of the question. Sorry? Uh, it's the incomparison to what. So where does the, you know, like what is what is positive impact and negative impact? Yeah. Um, it's a holistic uh, assessment yeah. which is yeah. difficult to make, yeah. uh, but you, you can only do it by scaling up your, your, your tests and stats. Definitely. But one driver is money. Uh, there are a lot of impact investors that are looking for blue carbon financing now. So they want to see where they can do mangroves or uh, seaweed farms or whatever, that, as long as there's CO2 absorption. Yeah. And uh, if it's not successful, they won't invest. Uh, they're investing now, and um, you'll, you'll see which ones are going to be uh, the winning solutions. And uh, maybe I can also add to that, uh, we're quite heavily involved with a few uh, offshore wind development. And um, what we hear is from them is that uh, the tenders have become extremely competitive, not on price actually, but on one, the recycling of the end of life wind, uh, because the material, exactly, the material that that stops, uh, the wind turbines are made out of is very hard to recycle. So that's one. And then the second one is the, uh, the water biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And that's, they're not competing on cost anymore. They're competing on who yeah. can have the least invasive solution. So yeah, because the, the money is there. So they just yeah. put down the money for a bit. Yeah. And they have to be more, you know, it's outstanding. Yeah, and I, I think it was more the question is around the, um, you know, the, the, the standardization of what that means with whether it's biodiversity or nature inclusivity or impact on the environment in that, um, uh, you know, sometimes you'll see proposals come in and you, and, and you look at it and it's seen, it seen more as a tick box with the standard, um, you know, standard criteria that would, you would have seen historically in gender, for example, which would be like between 50-50 on the team. That doesn't address gender or equity, and I think it's the same risk for the future that comes in in relation to nature and environment and impact for choices we make today. So it's just more of a question of coming to your expect. I, I truly don't think there is a standardized way. Yeah. You see it now with, with impact measurements, whether it be the public or private companies. Like yeah. ESG scores. A shell has a higher ESG score than Tesla. Yeah. yeah. Because it has. Make a lot of sense. ESG is, uh, is, is actually a tick box regulation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if Shell and BP can be ESG, then it's really on the bare minimum that you can get, I would say. It's yeah. not the impact, yeah. right? So, yeah. Well, there was a study conducted um, by communicators exploring uh, what company, how companies were, were reporting in Europe and Italy. And um, when they were talking about ESG standards, what companies were doing in the corporate communications was actually highlighting not from zero, but from a point further on the scale, which appeared to show a higher uptake. So visually, it looks very powerful, but when you drill down to real data, then it's probably in the immensity of change. It's still a change, but it's more about that aspect of how um, how we define or, or set the boundaries on, on what the standard is to make sure that the mistakes of the past aren't made. So well, also don't have a clear answer of whether yeah. there's, there's regulation and rules and you know standards in place, but that, that it definitely refers to in a more broader sense to, 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 to impact. And if you yes. say, I walk around here and I hear the word impact out of everybody's mouth like a hundred times, but there's a danger in that as well, of eroding the concept of impact. Yeah. And, 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 and with that positive impact, uh, do a lot of you know impact washing or, or green washing and, 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 and not being aware of the negatives that can come with it as well. And I'm actually quite happy to hear that 
in the, in the energy sector that uh, there is a, there's a lot of attention for this. Um, I would wonder though if, if, if uh, you know, uh, inflation increases or uh, um, um, financial uh, uh, values get under pressure, uh, whether or not this is the, the first thing or the last thing to be taken out. But I, 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 let, let me, uh, uh, I think that's, a, that's something to keep in mind at least that they keep discussing. Well, and, and it sounds like, I mean, it just sounds like what's, you're just asking what's the standard. You know, it's like, where is the standard? Um, and that's my question as well. Like, when I see these governments coming, convening together, taking pictures, it's like, well, give us a roadmap. You know, what's, what, what are we doing right now? You know, what's next year? What's the year after that? Not 2050. I don't want to talk about 2050. Tell me about 2022. Tell me about 2023. Let's start there, where we are. And so you have to meet people where they are. And, and you know, work with them to define where we're going. And that's the biggest frustration I see with you know, the United States, is that you, know, you have a, a democratic government that is putting you know, billions and billions of dollars into the Infrastructure Act, and it's, it's kind of like throwing a whole bunch of uh, stuff on the wall and seeing what sticks. That's, that's kind of the, the strategy. And it's like, that's not a good strategy. I like to say healthy order creates better chaos. And we don't have the healthy order um, in, in society, in, in global politics. And so we're seeing all this chaos. You know, and so it's like we need to order this transition uh, in phases and roll it out in steps in order for it to work. Because if everybody's all doing their own thing, it's a, it's a tremendous waste of energy. So think of it as like a cloud bubble right now. We're just gonna talk about collective actions here in a second. But let's, let's all agree that um, good food is important. And so I'm gonna say this cloud bubble, with me looking at it with my attention laser, is good food is important. And now all you guys are putting your lasers on this, this cloud bubble, it goes and then people buy into it and that's how things grow. And so that's what I say the power of dreams is that if we dream together, nothing is impossible because we've already built this, you know, all these, these systems. And so it's just the next evolution of these systems is the inflection point that we're at right now. And so with that, with, you know, how can we take as a social entrepreneur, as, as networks, as companies, how do we take uh, a collective action step maybe together? Unknown has <laughs> uh, already taken time <laughs> collectively yeah. to switch it around. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is basically uh, what we do. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, supporting events like, like Impact Fest uh, that was officially hosted by uh, the city of The Hague. Or also, just last week, uh, we had uh, an event with Novian where we're introducing four startups that are now actively helping Novian to reduce uh, their energy consumption. We do that in three main ways. So we help, help startups get connected with corporates to actually bring their solution to scale, because I think in, in energy entrepreneurship, that's a, a big, big problem. Because it's uh, great to have an amazing solution uh, for let's say one megawatt, but how do you then take it to 20 so it's uh, applicable to a company like Nobian or Shell? Uh, we also have spaces. So we have a uh, Titan, of course, where we have kind of almost 50 uh, impact scales, and a lot of those also on energy. And then lastly, we also have an entrepreneurship school where we're trying to educate the, the next generation of entrepreneurs on uh, impact topics. I, you know, I've, I've heard great things. I've kind of checked out your portfolio and see, you know, what's being done. I think the we call it the, you know, the framework or the bones of uh, uh, a collective action, a social entrepreneurship culture is very alive and well in the Netherlands, um, and that's what makes me so excited to to come here and you know share this this time with you guys. You know, so, and then obviously the ocean is. Oceans of opportunities. Oceans of opportunities. There we go. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I got a, I got a drive uh, when I see a call for proposals. So if anyone sees a call for proposals and they have an idea uh, related to the ocean, then uh, we can look together and see how to build up a partnership which is very diverse, which includes education, nature, technology developers, research institutes, test centers, everyone needed to get that technology in the water. And everything that you learn from that process is also fed back into education. That's what I'd like to implement in my projects. And uh, so I'm open for, for business. Thank you.
Yeah, but my collective actions, one, one thing we do uh, with uh, NONG is uh, managing uh, 3D industrial value chains, where we bring together, for example, the whole value chain when it comes to battery, uh, UV battery line, from mining to uh, reuse of batteries. Um, we have the European Green Hydrogen Acceleration Center, where we bring together all kinds of parties uh, when it comes to green hydrogen. We uh, brought parties together to set up the first green steel factory in Sweden, uh, where we have the approach like, you know, okay, if we go to the customer, if that customer is prepared to pay a little extra to have green steel in the cars, okay, if that one is prepared to pay a little bit extra, what's the, the next step in the value chain? I also prepared, and then when everybody is lying, go to the green steel manufacturer, to the steel manufacturer, say, okay, are you prepared to, pay, to, to manufacture green, green steel, the green hydrogen? And, um, if all the other people or companies in the value chain are prepared to they also take a little bit of the additional cost. And the same we try to do now for the, um, for the solar uh, uh, business, the, the really innovative solar business in, in Europe, to, to try to avoid to sell out all the knowledge what we did with the conventional solar PV and, and bring it to China and, and lose all the knowledge. So if you talk about collective action, that's also one part that we're focusing on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a bit of a different kind of answer to this question, and I don't, so please allow me, but I, I hosted a panel not too long ago, and it was on climate finance, and the people introducing the topic, uh, one by one, started with, if we don't do anything now, hell will be upon us. If we don't do anything now, we'll die. And although, although there's some truth to it, unfortunately, um, my question to them was, okay, but what's the fun bit? Ah, okay, so what, 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 what is that? What is that future? What does it hold? And actually, there was hardly any answers to it. And what I like about this session, and I think I will put it to the collective, uh, collective energy in this in this group as well, is is that it's positive, right? We talk about dreams. We talk about uh, uh, having a, a cool pro project with, with with solar on seas. Uh, we talk about. We even talked about boom riding. Which I need to come back to because for a Dutch person that's like a, <laughs> a concept that, that's like, is that like bicycling? Yeah, 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 maybe, yeah, yeah, this might be a bit wilder. Um, but bring in, bring, in, bring in the fun while we're doing these awesome things together and, and don't forget to, to, to celebrate all the wins that we made together. Yeah, and that's a great point because people only do things for two reasons. If you fear it, you're scared of it, you like it, you love it. That's it. You know, so you either doing it out of scarcity or you're doing it out of abundance. And so if you talk about the positive, the hopeful things, that's where people get excited about. You know, people don't want the doom and gloom. And, you know, one of the things I, I hear a lot is the planet's not in danger. The planet's not in danger. I'll, I'll repeat that. Humanity's in danger. She's had five extinction periods. She's over four billion years old. She'll start over. She'll get rid of us. It's that simple. The planet's not in danger. And so there's hope in that. You know, it's like, okay. All right, our our accountability, our you know, our society, our humanity, like we're in control of, of what we do, you know. And so, if we're the, the planet's highest sentience, if we're the, the best version of tech that the planet produces, we should we you know you learn as a little kid you don't bite the hand that feeds and you don't shit where you eat, you know. And so we do both of those things, you know. So we need to stop doing those things. It's like, we need to love the planet. It loves us, it gives us everything for free. You know, we, we create scarcity by, by selling products and, and setting up, you know, corporations. And so if we model after nature, she doesn't ask us to pay, you know, her for the sunlight, for vegetation, for, for the animals, the, the, the bees and the pollinators that, that, that pollinate everything for us. You know, so we, we can learn some, a lot about nature that, that we've forgotten. And I think humanity actually translates into the ones who forget. And so we forgot more than we know um, as a civilization. So we need to just get back to remembering that um, the planet has already uh, developed these perfect systems over billions of years. And so the solutions are, are already in front of us. And so that's where my next my next is, is the power of partnerships. And, and I've been able to figure out um, how to leverage and utilize partnerships to you know, produce events, to raise money, to uh, have entertainment, um, to integrate social impact into these events. 
and then talk about solutions. And I, I find it so, it's the funnest thing for me to, is to pitch in front of kids. When I say kids, like the, the 17 to 25 year olds, I'm 35 now, um, but, you know, so not too far away you know, from them, but they just get so excited and they're so conscious. And so when you think of the young people, they are the planet's best tech. Their capacity is off the charts for, for information. They can scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll, and you'll ask them things, random things, and they'll know. You know, they'll know something about it. And that's the hope is in these younger generations who are the best tech. You know, so we need to start asking them what they're willing to work on, what they're willing to produce, and how they need to get there. Instead of going up, you know, to the, the older generations that have this, this cultural callousness, you know, about it, like to where if things may not have gone perfectly in their life, there's some bitterness or some resentment there, and where those kids don't have that. You know, they're, you know, kind of these unpolished gems. And that's what I've, I've, I've found, and I don't think I gave the story of the STEM gems, but uh, I'm wearing uh, some jewelry that, this is a blackjack jasper. This is a rock in the Hawaii Mountains in Idaho, and my, 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 one of my best friends is a lapidary uh, silversmith. And so if you were walking out in the mountains in the desert, you know, it's a high desert in southern Idaho, and you've seen this rock in, on the ground, it looked like a dirty old rock. You wouldn't even know it was a gem. But you give it to him, you pol he polishes it, cuts it, sets it in silver, it's a gem. You know, so that's kind of like students, you know, they're uncut stones, you know, like to where we're setting up the STEM gems program, and Idaho is actually called the gem state. Um, we're setting up the STEM gems where these students, we say, hey, what kind of gem do you want to be? You know, it's like, we know you're the stone right now, but we're gonna help refine you into the, the gem that you want to be. So we're gonna set up your, the incentives based on what you care about, and we're gonna provide opportunities around what you care about. You know, and so we put up guardrails for them to take on, you know, to start their entrepreneurial journey. And that's been very rewarding for me. Um, I found that when I pursue my own fulfillment, I never find it. When I help people pursue, you know, pursue and, and realize their own fulfillment, that's how energy works. Energy works the best in a feedback loop. You know, to where it's reciprocated, it's given, and then it's reciprocated. You know, so I think that's the true uh, sustainable model is a form of barter, uh, the barter system where I exchange my energy, my skills, my talents, and you know, corporations and governments, they pay me to innovate for them. Um, that has been a very, very slow and painful and an exhausting process, um, getting you know to this model to where it's very cohesive, it's very understandable, and the proof is in the actions. Raised over a million dollars for community events. Um, I could, you know, if, if I had another million, you know, to do, we would work on changing the world with just that much money. And so we have B I see VCs all over the place talking about these massive funds, billions and billions of dollars. And say so the social entrepreneur with the right principles and fundamentals doesn't need billions of dollars, you know, because he knows how to use our kinetic red energy and turn it into valuable uh, products that come to life. And that's the, the model that I want to share. It's taken me 10 years and lots of trials and tribulations um, to do that. And you know, some of our, our future plans is the lead startup model, you know giving a template out, sharing that. And I'm, I'm more than happy to share that with anybody on how we fundraise and, and how we set up um, our, our organizational operations, whether it's for events, whether it's for new initiatives, whether it's for other startups that are outside of the energy space. Uh, I'm also in regenerative agriculture. You know, education is, is a huge piece. And then film, you know, I, I think we can tell these stories through film and then it's, you know, with, with things like this, we can share these, these uh, events you know, on LinkedIn or YouTube or all these other platforms to share these best practices because these guys all have expertise in their specific respective fields and it's just hard to share all of those um, like if we're not in the same room. You know, if I'm in America, it's hard to have these, these authentic you know, conversations, these relationship building exercises you know, unless we're at places like this. And so the, the future plans, um, I think the biggest one, my, the big takeaway here is that we're, we're setting up an international sister city partnership between the city of Boise, which is the capital of Idaho, 
Um, beautiful, beautiful city, but it's it's growing incredibly fast, and and we want to set that up with the Hag, and so that's where all these guys come in. They have tremendous networks. These organizations have tremendous networks, and so we're just asking them um, how we be of service. You know, as a social impact 501c3, my 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 soul, the the, the highest. Um, version of myself is when I'm completely of service. That's when I'm, I'm doing what, I sh what I'm sent here to do. Um, and so that would be, I think the, I think that was about it. I've, I've rambled on enough, and if we have any questions from the audience, uh, we'd love to you know, field any of those, or if there's any, you know, anything that you guys would like to add. Our future plans. Future plans, yeah, yeah. I mean, so we've talked about where we are, and maybe we talk about where we're going. Does anybody anybody have anything to add right now, or we should we start there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, no, I have more questions. Oh, okay. Well, then uh, we're currently in the process of uh, setting up a lot of different funds with big corporates, where we can actually invest into startups to then also uh, do projects with these big corporates to accelerate the energy transition. And, and that's such an important piece, is convincing the corporates to allow those opportunities to happen. Yeah, but they have buy-in, they have yeah. skin in the game, they have, that because a lot of the time we see, yeah, they're, they're excited up until they have to do stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the caveat being, they're excited until they got a right check. That's where the accountability with corporates is at, is writing the check. So I'll know when people are serious, when they're saying, okay, who do I make the check out to? That's when you know that they're serious. Yeah, so that's also the, the core thing with, with our group, is that we want to work with corporates who are serious about us, uh, actually working with startups, innovating, and don't just want to keep doing the same thing, business as usual. And uh, so that's the, the core strategy for us. Really important. In, in important. key areas like energy, manufacturing, for me, uh, it's where I started uh, the, the panel discussion. Uh, I'm going to do projects that contribute to uh, an affordable and robust energy system uh, taking place at sea. And I would like to see uh, the kite that you invested in uh, operate in one of the wind farms, uh, probably somewhere in France or Belgium, where the currents are a little bit higher than the Netherlands. I would like to see uh, large-scale seaweed production uh, in wind farms uh, off the coast of uh, Flanders in Belgium, where the laws are already uh, very open for it, more open than the Netherlands. I hope that uh, in 2024 we're going to see the first three megawatts floating solar farm in a Dutch wind farm, and I hope that we're going to see a wind farm in Denmark with. Uh, a line of wind, uh, wave energy generators uh, around it. And I, uh, I think I have not work um, towards that. <laughs> That's yeah. my future uh, drive. I think that we will even yeah, continue uh, investing in, in uh, new startups, but also have more focus on uh, the existing portfolio to boost them even more, uh, attract new uh, external funding <coughs> to, uh, to be able to, to do follow up investments. And I find I'm also looking very much forward to the Business Boost event we had this year in Lisbon, but next year it will be in Amsterdam, home, uh, home uh, country. So uh, really looking forward to contribute to, to the organization. I think the future, the future plans for UK are really building that, uh, that impact, uh, impact, that impact ecosystem, impact funders. I am, um, for me personally, it's to broaden and deepen the whole sector of impact funds. Um, to deepen because I see that there's still a lot of money that needs to be deployed and finds no way to, uh, to current funds because there's a mismatch in what big capital search for and what the impact funds have to offer. It's in liquidity, it's in all these kind of things. Um, so, so helping some organization on that. And to broaden is also to then kind of bring it to, to geographies where it's, where it's less known right now. So I help uh, set up impact funds in, uh, in countries east of the EU right now and we're going to do it in MENA. Um, uh, as well, and we start simple. So I have, a, I have an awesome job there, really, is to come in uh, and then tell to kind of confuse people that say we don't have the legislation and experienced investors say that we need to start with 40 million. Um, they can't really deploy it. Where should I start? 
I said, what do you, what do you really want to do? And just get started with small amounts of money. It's like a startup you work with, but then yeah. with the impact funds, uh, we'll, do the, we'll do the big things uh, when we're a couple of years uh, uh, onwards and everybody has the experience of doing so. So uh, building the ecosystem uh, uh, to go forward. And, uh, yeah, there's so many synergies. And thank you guys for, for sharing all that. And so, you know, when we, you know, at the conclusion of this event, I just, this was a finding common grounds um, exercise. And then we say for common good, you know, for social impact. And so there's, out of all, what, what all of your organizations are doing, I can find synergies, you know, just with what I'm, what I've done or what I, what our group has been doing. Like thinking about you, know, you have a portfolio, what I'd say with, you know, future plans or collective actions is like, hey, I'd like to take the top three, you know, your guys as rock stars and help them tell their story through film. You know, and with, with Peter, it's like, hey, if you want to connect with more oceanic entrepreneurs, it's like, hey, we in California, you know, like they have some really great funding opportunities. And uh, uh, NOAA is, is one, you know, that, or the National Science Foundation. And it's like, I'd be happy to share anything you want on our LinkedIn. You know, and then for, you know, it's like, hey, I might need to have to go to grad school and, and uh, test out that, that program and, and see if we can do some prototyping there. And obviously, with EVPA, I think you're more structured like like us in the terms of the net, the powers of the network, you know. And that's you know, you guys are planting seeds kind of all over the place, and so it's just more seeds, you know, more more gardening. And and uh, for context, my dad calls me the war chief, um, and he's he I grew up he used to, he he always used to say this saying that it's better to be uh, the warrior in the garden than the gardener in the war. And so, uh, culturally, you know, I've, I've had to fight and I've had to battle, you know, to get corporates to care, you know, sometimes, especially in, you know, remote, remote North Dakota, where the agricultural community that we that we that we were when I grew up got kind of terraformed into an industrial complex. And once that transition happens, you can't go back. Um, you, you can, but it takes, you know, that 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 extraction has to stop before it can change back. And so I joke, which is not necessarily a joke, that I'm a political refugee from North Dakota. Um, just because we have thousands of flares that are going on around my town, and people don't, it's not just gas that's coming out, it's carbon monoxide, it's, it's uh, hydrogen sulfide, it's dioxin. You know, these are, these are air toxics that are literally poisoning my town. Um, and so that's a, that's a, a sad thing to talk about. Um, and doesn't get talked about at all in the, uh, the global view of oil and gas. And so, those, but that's a reality, that's a truth. And so if people feel a certain way about it, that's the truth, you know. Um, and it's unfortunate that I have to do this and, and come to different countries to say this, um, but the people in my hometown, they don't want to hear it, you know. They're kind of being poisoned and, and uh, they, they, they're forced to buy into this, this system. And so, when you talk about that energy demand, we can go back to slavery, servitude, you know, indentureness, it's still happening. Uh, it's in first world developed countries. And so, it's, it's a different form, you know, but we still have to talk about it. You know, it's very uncomfortable to say that, you know, but I have to say it. And so, with that, you know, let's end on a good note. I, I'm very thankful and honored that, that you all joined um, with this panel. It's, it definitely helps me get a better understanding. And I'm, one thing I'll say about the Netherlands and the Dutch is that you, the conversations I have about sustainability or climate action are so vibrant. You know, like they're so welcomed. You know, here and they're you know more recent. The last couple of years they've changed. They're changing in the United States. But you're like, oh, you're a tree hugger, or oh, you're this or that. I'm like, I'm a realist. You know, I'm thinking 20 years ahead. I'm in 2035 thinking that if we continue what we're doing, our, our whole system's gonna collapse. You know, and, and it sputtered, it sputtered real bad. We, and COVID was kind of a blessing and a curse, some silver linings there, is that our emissions, we, we realized that we can drop our emissions drastically. You know, so that would be the silver lining of, of COVID, is that it showed us how kind of broken our system is, but it also showed us all these opportunities. And I think that's why we're all here is, is opportunities and building ecosystems and really catalyzing that social impact. So again, thank you guys. I think we're out of time. Um, thank you so much for, for joining.